All right, folks. Well, thank you so much for joining us today. So this is the ISBINTA webinar. Uh, the Special Interest Group on Aging has put together this webinar on rethinking healthy aging with an emphasis on outcomes and interventions. Uh, our first speaker in today's lineup is Dr. Jennifer Copeland. She is from the University of Lethbridge in Alberta, Canada, and her expertise are in the effect of movement behavior on health across the lifespan. Um, just before we get to Dr. Copeland's talk, uh, a reminder that there is a Q&A button at the bottom of your Zoom screen. We are welcome to use that to ask questions throughout the talk. Um, we will be asking, or we will be waiting to ask questions of the speakers till the end of both speakers' talks. Um, so please continue to add your questions in the Q and A in the Q and A section of Zoom, uh, and we'll monitor that and uh, bring your questions forward at the end of both talks. Without further ado, Dr. Copeland, the floor is yours. Thank you. Hi, everyone. Uh, thanks for the introduction, Shilpa, and uh, thanks to all of you for the opportunity to uh, speak with you today. When this was scheduled, uh, you know, months ago, I thought this would be a really interesting thing. I hadn't done a lot of uh, online uh, presentations. It turns out in recent times, I've actually done quite a few of them now, so this isn't quite as novel as I was expecting it to be. Uh, so I am going to turn off my video for the presentation, and I will see you after. Great. Okay, so as Shilpa mentioned, the goal today is to, to talk about healthy aging uh, and perhaps thinking about income outcomes and interventions related to healthy aging from a, from a somewhat different perspective. So before we can think about healthy aging, we should think about what the definition of health is. And so if we look to the World Health Organization for the definition of health, uh, they define it as a state of complete physical, mental, and social well-being, and not merely the absence of disease or infirmity. So if we think of this as a concept, you know, along a, along a continuum with mort the worst case scenario being mortality at the far end of the continuum, and then of course, as we move up, we have morbidity, and there's that line uh, that we cross where we no longer have any uh, diagnosed diseases or conditions. As we move to the farthest high optimal end of the continuum, we have what we would call wellness or well-being. So according to the World Health Organization, we have to move not only across that line in the middle, um, but also to the far end of the continuum. So, so what is wellness then? Well, again, according to the World Health Organization, wellness is the optimal state of health of individuals and groups with two focal concerns, the realization of the fullest potential of an individual across many domains, uh, and the fulfillment of one's role, expectation in, role expectations in many domains. So quite a lofty goal for wellness and certainly something to strive for. But what if we think about older adults and we think about some of these concepts uh, in terms of healthy aging? So here I'm showing you some data uh, from a paper in The Lancet, this, uh, where they examined um, multimorbidity, so the co-occurrence of diagnosed chronic conditions, uh, from a large data set of 1.7 million people in the UK. I chose this, this graph just because I actually like the way they displayed the data, but regardless of what country you examine this from or what, which nationally representative data set you look at, the conclusion is almost always the same which is that most people, most older adults, people over the age of 65 have more uh, than one chronic condition. So most people over the age of 65 are multi-morbid. So this calls into question the, the single disease framework that many of our healthcare systems are arranged around and much of our health research as well. So multi-morbidity itself is a phenomenon that needs more study uh, and that needs more coordinated treatment options. But if we think about older adult health specifically, it is, uh, there are unique considerations or health challenges that older adults face that don't really fit specifically into uh, categories of disease. So in uh, 1965, Dr. Bernard Isaacs kind of coined the term the geriatric giants, and he was referring specifically to, to these four conditions immobility, instability, incontinence, and uh, impaired intellect and memory. 
So these are problems that are highly prevalent uh, among older adults, but because they aren't diseases per se or don't fit neatly into a category, they were often neglected. So this concept has continued and carried on into us defining these things as what we call geriatric syndromes. So what is a geriatric syndrome? Well, it's a condition that's highly prevalent among older adults, has a significant negative impact on quality of life, but is, does not fit neatly into a disease category and also uh, is multifactorial in nature. So some examples of geriatric syndromes, it really depends uh, what paper you read, what book chapter you're reading, what, what the list of geriatric syndromes looks like. So uh, the ones I've chosen here are quite common uh, in many papers. So these include cognitive impairment, mobility impairment, frailty, falls, incontinence, and depressive uh, symptoms. So other ones that you will see on other lists and other papers include um, dizziness, and sensory air impairments, uh, such as hearing or vision impairment, and chronic pain. Sometimes these are considered a, a normal part of aging, which is why they're neglected both in clinical settings and in research settings, but this is not actually the case. So prevention of these, early recognition and treatment can have a huge impact on, on quality of life. So they're important to consider. To give an idea of how important, I, I wanted to show you some data from a study uh, from 2016 uh, from the Health and Retirement Study in the US. And what they did here is uh, attempt to predict uh, which combinations of chronic conditions, uh, geriatric syndromes, and functional limitations can influence self-rated health and mortality over a two-year follow-up period. So these are the chronic conditions, functional limitations, and geriatric syndromes they examined. Uh, so in functional limitations, they looked at strength limitations, uh, limitations in activities of daily living, and limitations in instrumental activities of daily living. And what they found uh, is that they identified the top three predictors for mortality over the two-year follow-up, for fair or poor self-rated health at the end of the two-year follow-up, or for a, a decline in self-rated health, so worse self-rated health over the two years. And what you can see here is that there are actually no chronic conditions that made the top three list uh, in terms of these negative outcomes. And that geriatric syndromes and functional impairments were more significant in predict predicting uh, negative health over a two-year follow-up period. So in particular, difficulty walking several blocks, as well as limitations in ADLs uh, and IADLs were the strongest predictors of these changes. Another uh, recent systematic review uh, that was published in BMJ Open looked at studies that compared treatment and health outcome priorities among patients with multimorbidity. And what they found is that physicians or clinicians tended to prioritize reducing the risk of mortality. So life expectancy was the top priority for most clinicians, whereas patients prioritized preserving functional ability. This varied a bit depending on the degree of morbidity and the chronic conditions that were present, but this was the overarching finding is that clinicians and patients had different priorities in terms of health outcomes and in terms of treatment priorities. If we can clear, it's interesting to note that these influence both of these factors. The, these influence uh, the risk of mortality as well as preserving functional ability. So this is another uh, example of the fact that we need to consider uh, in a review that was just published last year in the Journal of Internal Medicine of Multimorbidity. Furthermore, there seems to be some common pathway that underlie all three of these factors. 
And so there are a number of uh, biological factors, care-related factors, and psychosocial factors that can influence in research can help us Uh, it looks like we've lost Jennifer. Um, just give us a moment while we try and figure out how to get her back and uh, hopefully we'll be able to get back on track in a quick minute. Am I back? Yes, Jennifer, can you please Hello. try to... Uh, I don't know, it's, of course, this hasn't been a problem all week, but now it's a problem today, my apologies. So now I'm unclear when I lost you and what the last thing people heard was. <laughs> um, maybe just stick with, uh, maybe go to the slide before because your, your sound was uh, cutting out as well. Uh, of course, today this would happen. Sorry, everyone. Oh, uh, so this one? Um, I can't Is see. It was the interplay between chronic disease. This one? You have yeah. to share your screen again. Jennifer. Yeah. <laughs> oh, I do. Oh. Oh, goodness. Of course. If, if, if uh, this happens, I can share, I can use the slides from my computer. But for now, let's keep, go. keep going. Good to go. And now you can see it. Excellent. Okay. Uh, so, as I was saying, that you did not hear. Uh, Sorry, Jennifer. I'm, now I'm getting a message that there's still a problem. Am I good, Shilpa? Jennifer, may I suggest the following? Uh, I will share my, I will send a uh, Pass the slides from my computer that will re reduce your bandwidth and we will listen to you. Just say next slide and I'll click. Is that okay with you? Okay. Yeah, I apologize, everyone. No problem. So let me know. I'll, I guess I'll see. Just one minute. Uh, just one second here. So this slide is this one. We are in the bidirectional interplay between chronic disease. Uh, perfect. Yes. Right. Excellent. Sorry about that. So uh, what I was going to mention about this is just, this was a, a recent uh, review in the Journal of Internal Medicine uh, that emphasized this bi-directional interplay between chronic disease, uh, geriatric syndromes, and functional outcomes. So while multimorbidity uh, and exacerbate chronic disease as well. There's also a number of different factors, biological factors, uh, as well as social factors that can influence this cycle at all levels. So considering more of these variables and in a more integrated way uh, within our research can help us better understand healthy aging and help us design more successful interventions. So next slide, please. Great. So what are the research implications of these things? Well, I think, uh, and I'll just, get, I'll just get you to click through, Antonio, thanks. This slide adds some arrows. Great. So the research implications of this are that um, we need to be thinking about this interplay between geriatric syndromes, function, and chronic disease. And what's interesting for the people on this uh, that are joining us here today and for the members of uh, Jennifer, you're cutting out again. Um, 
I'm wondering if maybe we, we go to Catherine's presentation and we come back to you or Can you hear us? I think we lost her again. Okay. Uh, <laughs> Catherine, are you ready to go? Maybe I'm back. Oh. I can, and I'm <laughs> so sorry. It's not been a problem for more than a week, and now. Uh, Jennifer, I'll, I'll, we were just saying I'll, we'll go to Catherine's presentation because your sound was cutting out again as well. So maybe we'll come back to you um, for like a wrap up. Yeah. Okay, great. Sorry. All right. So our next speaker is uh, Dr. Catherine Bowman. She's a professor at the Open University of the Netherlands, and her expertise are in e-health, uh, vulnerable groups, and in lifestyle behavior. So Dr. Bowman's talk will speak uh, more directly to the interventions that we can do, we can uh, consider when we're rethinking aging. So without further ado, go ahead, Dr. Bowman. Thank you. Uh, good, good evening for all. And I first would like to thank Jeanette and Shilpa for uh, inviting me. And thank you all for being in this session. Um, I want to get my slides, just a moment, to look share screen. Uh, yes. Okay, and I will uh, put my camera off as well. Uh, let's have a look here. Catherine, you are muted. Okay, now it should work. Yeah, so I will skip my first slide. Uh, I don't know where it is. Uh, uh, it uh, has been, but um, the scope of my presentation will be on the physical uh, on the physical activity interventions that we have developed and evaluated uh, among other adults. And I want to share uh, our findings today and talk about the lessons we have learned. So in comparison with Jennifer, uh, I will go more into detail on physical activity as a way to support uh, healthy aging. Here you see our research group on uh, physical activity. Denise Pils and Jeanette Boekhout finished their PhD on uh, the subject. Jeanette uh, chairs uh, this uh, ISBNPA special interest, interest group and she also arranged uh, this webinar. Esme Volders, uh, you see her on the right, she is uh, currently fi finalizer, finalizing her PhD and the principal investigator of uh, the uh, physical activity interventions, uh, Dr. Professor Lo Dr. Lechner and I, we supervise the projects where I'm going to talk about. Uh, Brenda Behrens uh, uh, worked, worked on one of the projects as a postdoc. Uh, um, so, uh, now I have to go to the next slide. Yeah. So why is it important to focus on physical activity in older adults? First of all, our worldwide population is aging rapidly. For example, in the Netherlands, uh, the aging uh, population will be more than double from 14 till, uh, till nearly 30% in 2040. And this also means a rise in chronic diseases such as cancer, cardiovascular disease, and type 2 diabetes, and a rise in multimorbidity as we get more high-aged elderly. This situation causes, of course, limitations in mobility and in daily functioning of elderly, uh, while it also increases the number of cognitive problems, loneliness, decrease in well-being, well etc. Another important con consequence of aging is the strong decline in physical activity. And we all know how important it is in, for example, preventing chronic diseases and also for healthy aging. It keeps your muscles strong, your bones strong, it prevents falls, and it's crucial for cognitive functioning. Many older adults, however, do not meet the physical activity guidelines. 
as you can, can see on the graph, only half of the 65 till 69 age, age group meets the guideline. And as you also can see, fewer and fewer elderly, elderly meet the guideline uh, um, uh, when they get older. In, for example, the 80 till 84 age group, it's not more than 20% that meets the guideline. And that's even worse in low educated people and people who suffer from a chronic disease. Uh, for those who are not familiar with uh, the physical activity line guideline for older adults, that's 150 minutes a week, so two and a half hours of moderate to vigorous physical activity. And that's not all. Also muscle, bone, balancing, improving activities for at least twice a week must be added. So uh, to summarize, it's important to stimulate older adults to become more physically active, but also to stay active not only in a supportive way, but also in doing daily activities. Knowing the importance of physical activity, 10 years ago, we started Active Plus, which is uh, Active Plus in Dutch, for adults over uh, 50, and it's a personalized self-help intervention. The intervention aims to increase the target group's awareness of their own physical activity, and that's the first necessary step to also stimulate them to become more active and to maintain that activity. It gives, it gives uh, participants three times within four months a computer tailored advice and tailored means that it's personalized. Participants first have to fill in a questionnaire and subsequently they, see, they receive personally relevant advice based on their individual answers to the questionnaire. In our first project, we delivered the, the advice only on paper, as you can see here on above. And as we um, in the second version, participants could also use an online version that also included uh, an interactive website. So Active Plus is very accessible and it can reach many people. The intervention was systematically developed using the intervention mapping uh, protocol. And that's a protocol for the systematic development of behavioral change interventions. I can highly recommend it if you are going to develop an intervention. Um, the screen shows an example of how we influence the participants' awareness of their own physical activity behavior. The first theoretical method we used was raising consciousness. We made that practical by showing the comparison of their own physical activity with that of similar others and with the physical activity guideline. The grid on the right shows the way this information was presented to the participants. The second theoretical met method was self-monitoring. And here we have encouraged participants to monitor their physical activity in a logbook. Below you see the references uh, of the, um, wait, the, the intervention uh, or the protocol study we have described in a, a paper. Um, so now you may wonder how this personalized intervention looks. The left part here shows part of the personalized advice, which is automatically, automatically generated for the, for the client. You can take some time to read if you want. As can be seen, we link the advice to the, end, to the answers of this lady. And participants also received videos or pictures of exercises that can be done at home, which is shown on the right. Um, an essential question is, of course, whether the intervention results in more physical, physical activity. In a randomized control trial, we compared a print delivered and a web-based version. And it's important to add that the participants could not choose between the delivery channels. Furthermore, both versions had an extra component to influence participants' perceptions on the possibilities they have, uh, they have to be active together and to be active in their physical environment. We, for example, included personalized information on sport clubs, on walking and cycling tracks in the neighborhood. And this resulted in four experimental conditions to be compared and a no advice control group. 
This slide shows the effects of the intervention. The blue color, uh, the blue bar shows the baseline. Green uh, is the physical activity after six months, and orange is the 12 months physical activity. Most importantly, all versions have shown higher physical activity after six months compared to the control group. On average, uh, 200 minutes more a week. But it's difficult to persevere on the long run, as you can see. Important to mention is that we found a more positive results for the printed version. Here, the main effects, uh, re the, the, uh, the physical activity effects remained at 12 months, and elderly also more often participated in the print version of the study. They less often dropped out, and they all, they all showed a higher use and appreciation of the intervention. So, mainly the print version has very positive effects. All four versions were also highly cost effective and have shown a decrease in the incidence of physical, physical activity related diseases such as diabetes and cardiovascular disease. Not surprisingly, the print version was also most cost effective, so cheaper with the same effect. That proven effectiveness cost effectiveness and high feasibility lead to the nationwide acknowledgement of the Active Plus, which means that the intervention has been included in the Dutch database of effective interventions. Denise Peels, you see her on the right, she, she conducted all this work and has written her PhD uh, research uh, thesis on this research. Just as in many other projects, the closing of this project inspired us to further improve the intervention itself, but also its reach. We tried to make it more suitable for vulnerable groups. So this slide contains a list of all subsequent projects. The first two have been finished and concerned grants of a Dutch, a Dutch fund for vulnerable groups. Some are still ongoing and one is coming in September. And I will now provide a quick overview of the projects as they show how we have optimized the interventions and they also reveal what we have learned about ways to involve older adults and how to involve stakeholders. In the first project, we adapted the Active Plus intervention for 50 plus, um, which, which we started. Uh, to the specific target group of singles of 65 years and older with a chronic disease that comes with physical impairments, for example, arthritis or COPD. Just as the, in the original intervention, we used the intervention mo uh, mapping protocol for adapting it. And main adaptations were that we provided personalized advice and brochures on the personal uh, chronic condition. We also gave insight into the opportunities to be uh, physically active despite the disease. Secondly, we further integrated uh, Active Plus in the local network. We more intens intensively made them aware of the local uh, physical activity possibilities. We also stimulated social interaction between elderly, but also uh, between, uh, with other groups. And we offered a choice in the delivery channel, so print, online, or both. And while elderly, while elderly also could help get help, help with the digital uh, um, version of the program. As shown below, we were able to reach a vulnerable subgroup. The average age was uh, 76. 56% uh, of the people had a low educational level, 70% a chronic disease. However, a weakness was that we only uh, that only nine percent of the invited elderly uh, participated in this study. Uh, this slide shows that physical activity has improved within the intervention group. However, it was no, not more effective than the reference group who received the original uh, Active Plus 50 version. Uh, so the new intervention did not turn out to have an extra positive effect. Considering the delivery mode and its predictors, the project has revealed that the printed delivery mode achieved a higher pr 
participation than the online delivery mode. Um, and we also saw that in our first project. Participation in the online delivery mode was also associated with younger age and with higher levels of social support for physical activity. The follow-up response was also higher in the print group. And in line with this finding, attrition turned out to be associated with partic participation in the online delivery mode and a lower educational level. My colleague, Jeanette Boekhout, who uh, organized this session, uh, performed the study and also the study that I just explained now. And if you want to know more about it, just ask her because she will be very willing to send her your PhD thesis. So to conclude, uh, this study teaches us that online delivery has potential for uh, for the group of single older adults with physical, uh, physical impairments. However, it's still the question whether print is better or a combination of print and online or even other support measures are needed. A second challenge is how to increase reach and how to keep elderly with low educational levels involved. These experiences were taken into account in the next implementation study. In that study, we implemented the Active Plus 65 version in eight municipalities in the south of the Netherlands. Two municipalities offered the online version and the print version, so people could choose, and the other one, uh, other uh, six municipalities only online intervention. We again uh, used a network approach, though intensified it to achieve a better participation and adherence of the 65 plus population. We, for example, actively involved elderly. We connected with senior citizens leagues and welfare organizations, and we pro provided again uh, digital support. We also stimulated elderly to uh, be active together. And for that reason, we paid more attention to the social aspect of physical activity and the benefits of being active together to help each other and to become more actively involved, for example, in your neighborhoods. We, of course, uh, measured the effects again and saw an increase in physical activity and a decrease in loneliness at six months. The project furthermore has shown a potential with regard to the online version and the potential to also influence loneliness. So it shows that, it, that it's possible to broaden the uh, uh, intervention targets of the original Active Plus intervention that was only uh, directed to physical activity. In our next project, we are studying the effects of Active Plus on cognitive functioning. I will only address uh, them briefly. Uh, our PhD, Esme Volders, is conducting this research. And in a randomized control trial, she is testing whether the improvement of physical activity as a result of our program also results in improvement of cognitive functioning. And again, among uh, 65 plus. She has published already two papers, a protocol study and a study on physical activity, uh, physical activity effects, and the one on cognitive effects is currently in progress. So now it's time for a short break of reflection. Um, based on our experiences, we have formulated, formulated directions for further optimization of the intervention interventions to stimulate physical activity in elderly. And most important issues are the reach and willingness to participate. They need to improve. This also accounts for uh, intervention adherence and the prevention of attrition. And we also see that an online intervention is promising, though maybe the target groups still profit most of printed materials or a mix of online and print. This especially might account for single elderly with a chronic disease. Maybe uh, they need more a blended approach, for example, with face-to-face -face coaching, and they definitely need help with digital, digital skills. We, we also um, see that uh, the facts uh, um, 
need to be uh, strengthened, um, especially long-term effects need to be achieved, especially in the subgroups, because we saw strong effects in the 50 plus groups, but in uh, the 65 years uh, group, it went less. So there's still more to gain for those who are single, old and ill. Fortunately, we received grants to further develop and optimize our interventions. The first one is the Active Plus, uh, the Active for Life project. Simone Thomas and Ellen Columban are the PhDs uh, involved. The project consists of three uh, main phases. The first one is a data uh, research in which we combine all previous intervention data sets in one. And in this way, we will study which behavioral determinants and uh, change strategies are the most important to stimulate online intervention use and effects. Secondly, we will develop new intervention elements that are going to be tested in a randomized control trial. Main question is which high potential interactive behavioral change strategies, you see them here, an activity tracker, uh, an ecological momentary assessment intervention and a chatbot um, to find out whether they can increase use and effectiveness of the online intervention and also engagement, of course. We will integrate these elements, elements into existing uh, online physical activity interventions that we have, for example, in the uh, Active Plus intervention, but also in other phys uh, physical activity interventions that we developed. Um, and we will uh, um, subsequently um, test them in an uh, implementation study and we test the effects on, again on uh, use effects and uh, on physical activity and engagement. Uh, the second project I want to mention is the Healthy Aging project that aims to stimulate active aging in older adults, especially in those with low socioeconomic position. And we will use a com community approach in neighborhoods in which we will intervene on multi-dimensional aspects of healthy aging. But physical activity, social networking, cohesion, but also digital skills are important targets uh, in this. And we use the social model of health perspective as a framework for our healthy aging intervention. So far, uh, my brief overview of the research that we have been conducted to improve the uh, physical activity in older adults. And we have seen that computer tailoring works in elderly, but still need to find out, found ways to uh, reach vulnerable groups and to keep them involved. And hopefully our new projects that are uh, starting uh, just now will help to, uh, to solve this. To solve this. And I want, uh, finally, I want to thank you for listening. And I, of course, uh, would also like my colleagues and Professor Legner, the, the principal investigator of, uh, of our research group for their work. And if you have questions, just ask. You can ask them now or later on uh, when Jennifer uh, has finished her presentation. Thank you. So. Jennifer, can you try to talk, please, just for us to see? Hello, if it works everyone. More. Can you hear me? Yes. Yeah. Okay. Let's try it. So, just a, reminder, this just, just a reminder to everyone to put their questions in the Q and A tab, and we'll ask questions at the end of Jennifer's talk. <laughs> Which I am going to try again. Okay. okay. Thank you. So again, my apologies, everyone. We're going to try a different combination of technologies now. Uh, so this is approximately where I left off, uh, talking about this review from the Journal of Internal Medicine that I found really interesting uh, that really emphasized this bi-directional interplay uh, between you know, what we would traditionally define as a, a disease or a chronic condition, geriatric syndromes, and functional impairments. These all interact, uh, and importantly, there's a number of factors, biological factors, care-related factors, and social factors that influence this cycle at all levels. 
So the conclusion of that review was that uh, you need to consider more of these variables and perhaps in a more integrated way uh, in a clinical setting, but also in a research setting to help us better understand healthy aging uh, and to help us design more successful interventions. Okay, so next slide. Uh, so what are the research implications of this uh, then for us? Well, first, uh, as I've mentioned, I think we need to consider the interactions and the interplay of these various things when we're studying uh, what we call healthy aging. And the second is that when we're thinking about determinants of healthy aging or if we're thinking about intervention strategies and how to develop them, as we were just talking about, we know that movement behaviors, so uh, physical activity and sedentary behavior, or nutrition interventions can affect all of these factors, as well as in impact uh, their, the dynamic interplay between them. So it makes sense then to think broadly about what kinds of outcomes we wanna measure when we're um, working in the field of healthy aging. Next slide. So I've given some examples here of different tools that can be used to measure different categories of impairments or different geriatric syndromes. This is by no means meant to be an exhaustive list, and I should be clear, I'm not actually advocating for any of these necessarily. Um, I just wanted to give some examples of validated tools that exist for these different categories of measurement uh, that you may or may not be familiar with and, and might want to think about. So for physical function, I'm sure many of you are familiar with the uh, short physical performance battery or the seniors fitness test. Both of these fairly easy to administer in a variety of settings. Things like gait speed or usual walking speed uh, are great markers of health that can be measured quite uh, easily as well as balance, grip strength, measuring cardio, estimating cardiorespiratory fitness can be a bit more involved. There's also a number of tools and indexes that exist uh, for measuring uh, uh, activities, impairments in activities of daily living or in instrumental activities of daily living. And many of those have a physical component, so they can, they're also often used to measure physical function. Uh, cognitive function, uh, the Montreal Cognitive Assessment or the Mini Mental State Exam are both tools that are commonly used, although these are, are diagnostic uh, tools that are typically used for diagnosing uh, dementia or cognitive impairment, and they're not particularly sensitive to change uh, at a preclinical level, so it definitely depends on the study. Uh, the Behavior Rating Inventory of Executive Function, the Brief A, is a very common tool and well-validated tool for measuring executive function that is, that is more sensitive. Uh, there are other tests like the Weschler memory, memory Test or the Stroop Task uh, that are more performance-based measures of cognitive function. And those same indexes for ADLs and IADLs have, have some uh, cognitive components as well that could be useful. Next slide, please. So frailty, there are actually a number of uh, a number of scales out there for measuring frailty, and another number of different approaches uh, for measuring frailty. We could have an entire webinar on that, but we won't. Uh, so I've given you a few examples here of some of the more commonly used ones that you'll find in the literature, and sometimes the uh, short performance physical battery is actually uh, used to assess frailty as well. Quality of life and self-rated health can be relatively uh, simple to measure. I'm sure you're all familiar with the SF36 uh, or the EQ, perhaps the EuroQual 5D, uh, which measures five different dimensions of health. There are some that are specific for older adults. So the ice cap O uh, is a tool that's a broader measure of well-being as opposed to just health, so a much broader concept of wellness. Uh, that it was specifically validated for older adults. Uh, and self-rated health and perceived healthy aging are sort of one question uh, tools that are surprisingly powerful in a, in a number of studies for, for identifying differences and, and seeing the success of interventions. Depressive symptoms, there's also a large number of scales that exist for measuring depressive symptoms, both in adults in general and in older adults. Next slide, please. So this is not to, to go back to the model here, this is not to say that those tools haven't been uh, used in research on health behaviors before. We certainly have good reason to believe that changes in physical activity or sedentary behavior can influence these factors. So I just wanted to give you a few examples. So next slide, please. 
So these were some data from the Canadian Health Measures uh, Survey that uh, Dr. Dobra and I analyzed, uh, looking at a number of different health-related factors in older adults in relation to sedentary time. So this is a cross-sectional analysis of 1,700 older adults. And what you can see here is that we found that that simple question about self-rated health, uh, self-rated health was significantly um, was significantly higher in people who rep reported less overall minutes of device measured sitting time per day. Next slide. This is a study from uh, Kievel and colleagues where they were also interested in sedentary behavior, a specific sedentary behavior, TV time. Uh, and in fact, they, they determined the dose of TV time over a 10-year span and assessed its relationship with usual walking speed as their outcome. Uh, and as you can see here, they showed that people with the highest dose of TV time over the 10-year span had the slowest usual walking speed. Next slide. So this is another analysis uh, that Dr. Dober and I did together. We were very interested uh, specifically in looking at strength training and at what effect strength training would have on healthy aging, in particular among adults who are already meeting the minimum guidelines for endurance physical activity. So this was a cross-sectional analysis of over 9,000 older Canadians who uh, were categorized, who reported meeting the minimum guidelines of 150 minutes per week of MVPA. We then categorized them to determine if they get it, reported engaging in any strength training uh, or no strength training. And we looked at a variety of health outcomes. So if we go to the next slide, you can see, uh, so what we're looking at here are the odds ratios of being in the best tertile of scores for each measure among people who did any strength training uh, compared to those who reported doing no strength training. And so what you can see if we look at those odds ratios is that uh, it was significant for a number of functional measures uh, as well as self-rated health and self-rated healthy aging. But it wasn't significant uh, for type 2 diabetes or ischemic heart disease. So, of course, this doesn't mean that strength training is not part of, uh, of reducing the risk of chronic disease. I think we do have evidence uh, that it can be. But I'm just trying to make the point here that when you capture a broad assessment of health outcomes, you can sometimes get a more nuanced answer to your question. Next slide, please. And uh, the last example I'll use here is a study uh, from uh, 500 older adults in Spain that was published in 2017. And they were interested in looking at frailty uh, as an outcome, and particularly at the interaction between sedentary time and physical activity. So what you can see here is they, they uh, stratified their analysis by people who are meeting the World Health Organization physical activity guidelines, so that 150 minutes per week, and those who are not, and they calculated a frailty trait scale. This is another measure of frailty. I don't think I even included it on my list. And what they showed is that more breaks uh, in sedentary time were associated with lower frailty scores among physically active people as well as among inactive people. So clearly these outcomes can provide some valuable insight into how health behaviors and how the interaction of different health behaviors can influence aging in ways beyond the simple uh, presence of chronic disease and in ways that really impact quality of life and longevity. So next slide. So one of the last uh, points I just wanted to make, and of course it did, it did come up as well uh, in the previous talk, and, and I wanted to mention it originally because it, it's gaining increased uh, attention, but in particular right now as we navigate the pandemic and we all learn a lot more about uh, the concept of social distancing, uh, social isolation is becoming an increasing concern among older adults, even before the pandemic that was the case. Uh, so you can see here that some clinicians are advocating for social isolation and loneliness to be considered on the list of geriatric giants, the new geriatric giants, uh, because they're highly prevalent um, and the increasing in prevalence. What's interesting is that impaired function, uh, frailty, or multimorbidity are risk factors for social isolation and loneliness, but in fact, these are also outcomes of frailty, uh, morbidity, uh, and impaired function. So if we go to the next slide, 
you can see that, of course, functional impairments can lead to socialization, social isolation, because people are not able to perhaps get out and do the activities that they enjoy. The same is also true of morbidity. morbidity. But we also have uh, growing evidence that social isolation can in fact exacerbate morbidity uh, and lead to further functional impairments leading to this, uh, this cycle. And so of course, changes in movement behaviors, which is my particular interest, can disrupt this cycle and can actually impact it at all levels by reducing uh, morbidity, by reducing functional impairments, so improving physical function, uh, and potentially also by providing opportunities uh, for social interaction that can be beneficial to health. So I think uh, that this is an important outcome. Yep, next slide's great, sorry. Uh, so this is an important outcome to consider, I think. Uh, and while many of us perhaps, you know, wouldn't have thought of it much in terms of health behavior interventions, uh, I think you can see the interaction with health. And it's also relatively simple to, to measure. This is one example of a three-item loneliness scale that was used in that, in that study on social isolation that I referenced. Okay, so next slide. So hopefully uh, I've made my point here, which was to illustrate that older adults have unique health concerns uh, that need to be considered, uh, including multimorbidity, geriatric syndrome, and functional limitations. And so integrating more broad health outcomes into research with older adults can really benefit our understanding of how best to promote healthy aging and I think can really help benefit our uh, intervention design and development. So next slide. So thank you very much for your patience. Of course, technology never works when you actually really want it to work. Um, so thanks for sticking with us. And that was, uh, hopefully you got most of what I had to say today. I'm certainly happy to engage in some discussion now. And I just wanted to conclude with uh, a definition of health that I find quite concise uh, and, and is my preferred definition of health. So thank you very much, everyone. Thank you. Thank you to both speakers for joining us and, uh, and presenting uh, some great perspectives on uh, healthy aging. Open the floor to questions. Hello. Um, the first question in the Q&A that we have is from um, uh, Richard Rosencrantz, who says, given the dynamic interplay between chronic disease, physical activity, physical cognitive function, geriatric syndromes, what suggestions do you have for designing studies to understand the processes at work and how to intervene towards better health, well-being, and function. I think that one's for you, Dr. Copeland. Well, I'm gonna start my video and hope it doesn't crash the entire system. <laughs> um, so yeah, I, I, uh, I think the answer to that question, so I tried to give some examples of studies that have looked at some of these um, and perhaps maybe not so much the interaction. I think that very much depends on, on your study design. Uh, and of course, on, on your sample size, that the, um, the case for broadening our perspective of what we're defining as a health outcome, I think is pretty clear, um, particularly with, with older adults. Examining that, that interplay would be, is really interesting. And I can see lots of um, scenarios or opportunities for some really interesting mediation or moderation analyses. But of course, what you need then is, is a sample size to work with. Uh, and I think in particular, this is where uh, longitudinal or intervention studies can, can be really beneficial because I think you can get at some of those uh, more intricate questions better when you have um, you know, more than a cross-sectional design because these things are changing over time. So uh, I don't necessarily have specific examples of, of study designs, although I'm always happy to, uh, to chat about that. But because I really think it depends on your specific question. Uh, Dr. Bowman, did you want to add anything to that? Oh, you're on mute. <laughs> okay, I'm going to go to the next question. Uh, yeah, Jeanette did a, did a nice, uh, Jeanette Buchhout did a nice study on the uh, uh, interaction between uh, uh, loneliness and physical activity and also mediating effects. And what we saw, uh, what she saw was uh, that it, um, um, the mediation was there for uh, people with um, 
with a, 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 a more severe uh, impair, uh, impairment uh, uh, caused by their chronic disease. Great. So in subgroups, you saw the, uh, the mediation effect. Uh, so the next question we have in here is from an anonymous attendee. Uh, if you look at the definition of the World Health Organization's definition of health, it includes not only physical well-being, but also mental and social well-being. Most healthy aging research, however, seems to focus only on physical well-being. Uh, or if it does include mental or social well-being, it seems to focus on depression or on loneliness. Ooh, things are moving here, sorry. Uh, physical activity has been demonstrated to have positive effects on mental and social well-being. Should our research focus more on the effects that physical activity can have on mental and social well-being? Should ISBINPA have a role to play here? Do you want me to speak to that a little bit? Sure, yeah. Yeah, I mean, I totally agree that that's definitely, um, you know, a big, a big part of what I was trying to show with, with some of these examples is that we, we, it is definitely, we need to think beyond um, sort of physical health. And, and that paper on social isolation and I calling those the new geriatric giants was also definitely uh, making that point. Um, that the the interaction between social and mental well-being and physical well-being is is you know not something that we can ignore. So and I, I do think there is definitely a shift in that. We saw from from Dr. Bowman some studies that are definitely looking at these kinds of outcomes as their priority. So I think we're moving in that direction. Um, but I think it's something that perhaps we need to prioritize prioritize more. Uh, they're a bit more challenging sometimes to to measure than. Um, although I gave some examples of simple measurements, they can be harder to conceptualize than simple like diagnostic, uh, you know, chronic disease presence of yes or no kind of outcomes. So it makes me sometimes for more complicated studies, but I think it would be worth the effort. As for is somehow having a role here, I think we could uh, direct that question to Antonio maybe. Mm -hmm. uh, Dr. Bowman, do you have anything to add to that? No. <laughs> yeah, I thought uh, uh, Jennifer uh, um, asked uh, Antonio, isn't it? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, regarding isn't our role, of course, isn't by is, is very focused on on all the uh, all the outcomes that uh, result from an healthy and active lifestyle. So the aging seed is, uh, I think, uh, has a lot of uh, saying about this topic. So. Just, just go to our conferences and look at the journal, and we have a few uh, publications already on that. Is there a special interest group on mental health or social outcomes? We have more, the only, the more, most closely to that is motivation and behavior change. Sometimes it works, but mostly on mechanisms of action and not really as outcomes. So okay. it's a bit different. Great. Um, the next question is a compliment uh, to the speakers. Great presentations from Steve Phillips. Uh, next question is from Sophie Comprano, uh, to work for Dr. Copeland. Uh, interesting talk, just a small question. You mostly use uh, total sedentary behavior in your research, but some sedentary behaviors might also yield positive effects on health. Uh, for example, cognitively engaging uh, sedentary behaviors. Have you, do you have any information on which sedentary behaviors are most detrimental for older adults? Mm -hmm. I love this question uh, because I'm totally fascinated by this question. Uh, it's a great question. And uh, in fact, I just wrote a grant proposal to try to get someone to give me some money to try to answer this question uh, with some of my colleagues in, in neuroscience at the U of L. Um, but so, so it's true. Uh, and this is, this is particularly complicated. I would say perhaps with all adults, but, but maybe even more so uh, with, when you're working with older adults, uh, particularly retired older adults, where uh, a lot of their enjoyment and quality of life comes from activities that would actually meet the technical definition of sedentary behavior. So seated uh, socializing and games and, and things that, um, that they spend a lot of their time doing. And so telling them that those are bad for their health um, is probably not ideal, especially since it's not the, it's not the behavior itself we don't think. Uh, that's inherently problematic from a health perspective. It's the amount of time being spent in it. So, um, you know, Dr. Dogra and I have been working on developing an intervention for assisted living, and, and really the emphasis in that is about breaking up sedentary time as opposed to not being sedentary, because I think that's a more feasible and palatable goal. 
But for the question about which ones are most detrimental, uh, this is true actually across populations. Uh, when TV time consistently shows up as a negative predictor of health, uh, screen time. Uh, and, and so a, a big question then is, is it really that behavior or is TV time actually a marker of other things? Is it a marker of socioeconomic status? Uh, is it the things we do while we're watching TV, like eat potato chips? Um, I think there's a ton of really interesting questions to be answered there, both from a behavioral perspective, but also from an actual physiological perspective. And, uh, and these are studies that we all need to do. <laughs> and uh, certainly I hope to, to. So I don't really have an answer for you other than to say I can confirm from reviews of the literature that there's pretty solid evidence that TV time is bad. Why TV time is worse than reading uh, or doing puzzles, I'm not sure we can answer that yet. There's a lot of theories, but we don't have a definitive answer. Um, okay, the next question is from an anonymous attendee as well. Um, older adults seem to be very divergent group. Uh, there are huge differences in health and physical abilities. Is it possible to design interventions for all older adults? Uh, do you have suggestions on how to differentiate? Uh, you can use computer tailoring in the actual intervention intervention stage, but how do you differentiate when you're reaching the target group? So I think this one is for Dr. Bowman. Yeah, yeah. I think um, 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 elderly who are uh, involved in uh, kind of computers and uh, they are easy to reach um, by, uh, by the internet, for example, while uh, other uh, elderly um, Often low educated elderly are more difficult to reach. Maybe they can, you can reach them uh, in the neighborhoods by uh, uh, community uh, uh, interventions, but also via, for example, uh, the um, uh, general practice is a good option to do. But we are still searching how, what's the best way to reach the, uh, the low educated people. And in, in our intervent interventions, we were able uh, to reach about half of the, 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 the elderly were uh, low educated elderly. So via an, uh, sending an invitation to, um, uh, to cooperate or to, to uh, um, receive a uh, physical activity intervention via the municipality works for uh, quite some uh, low educated people. Only our intervention, um, in my opinion, has too much text, text, uh, written text uh, at this moment, so that needs to be changed. And, and maybe, uh, yeah, we also have to um, um, not only use uh, the letters to, to, to get them uh, involved, but also other channels, um, for example, via uh, coaches or uh, uh, health professionals who work in the community. So they have a good context over there, a contact with, with the people who live uh, in the neighborhood. And they are good channels, I think, to, uh, to reach these elderly who are normally difficult to reach. Um, yeah, and, and yeah. just to, I'll add to that a bit, because the question was around um, the range of physical abilities as well. I think uh, Dr. Bowman had mentioned in her talk that the, the, the um, interventions were individualized. And so that's one way to cater to the diversity of functional ability in these interventions. It is really difficult. I think, um, you know, people who don't work with older adults don't realize that there is a, a huge diversity in, in function, physical function and cognitive function. And so you do have to tailor to a very diverse group when you're creating interventions. It is, it is quite challenging. Um, it's it's 3.04. Um, if people want to stick around for a couple more minutes, um, we do have one or two more questions here. Um, maybe I'll uh, try and wrap the next two questions up into one, and then uh, I think you can get in touch with um, with us after the fact if you're if you're interested in continuing the conversation. So let me just see here. Um, there's a question around coordinating capabilities um, in terms of physical, mental, and social health, um, and, and how we might be able to do that. And then a question um, around um, measurement of physical activity and sedentary time and what would be good tools to accurately assess them in older people who are frail and pre-frail. Um, and what aspects would be most important to assess in future trials when physical function is the primary outcome? And that one is from Dr. Staffy. Okay, am I gonna go um, first? Yeah, sure. 
Um, so in terms of the, of the measurement, well, so in terms of the coordinating, uh, like the capacities, physical, mental, and social health, I, I mean, I, I agree. I don't know that to date we've, we've done a great job of, of integrating these. Uh, you know, I can't think of examples right off the top of my head, but I think it, I think it can be done uh, with some, some careful consideration of, of outcome measures. And I think there's a lot of validity to looking at them together. Uh, in terms of the measurement of physical activity in sedentary time, yeah, it's an interesting question, particularly around sedentary time. Uh, I'm not convinced we're really good at measuring that yet. But so uh, what I currently uh, sort of advocate for, I guess I would say, is a combination of device-based measures and self-report measures. Um, because this allows you to get at um, some, some precise uh, quantitative measures of dose and in particular of body posture. So, for example, uh, use active pals, which are inclinometers that can be attached to the side. I'm sure many of you are familiar with them. And this really uh, allows you to get some precise measurements of time spent in different positions. Um, but adding a self-report tool to that helps you get at some ideas about context. Uh, you know, the, the context of the types of activity, perhaps the type of activity that's being performed, which as we were discussing with the previous question, is, is um, very important in terms of sedentary behavior because it doesn't seem as though all sedentary behaviors are, are equal in terms of health outcomes. So some combination of tools, I think, is the way forward. I have not yet... Um, found a, a perfect way to integrate those those measurements. Um, and then I will also say, you know, there's been some really interesting stuff uh, done with like Dr. Chaston and, and Callum Leask using cameras uh, combined with, with device-based measures of movement to get at like the location and the type of behavior. And that that's really interesting. I'm just not, it's obviously not feasible on a large scale as of yet. Um, so, so I'm not sure there's a perfect answer, but I definitely uh, think a combination of uh, detailed quantitative profiles combined with some self-report assessments uh, are beneficial. I totally agree. We also uh, use a combination and especially for the reasons that you mentioned. So we use the actigraph because the actigraph is more easy to uh, to send it to people. They can uh, put it uh, on themselves, while the actipel is a bit more difficult. Uh, but the combination is really good uh, to also get information on the context. And uh, for us, it's also for the tailoring. It's it's really uh, good to know uh, what kind of activities uh, people do, and you only know that by self-assessment. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think there's there's lots around measurement. I mean, measurement of physical activity in sedentary time is one thing, but as we move to include more uh, isolated seniors into our programs, even being able to do some of the measurements, like if you have to do a phone survey, is there a validated one for, you know, physical function or whatever the case might be? And so I think this is something that we'll have to think more and more about um, if we want to access those seniors in our research programs. And I think we need to. I mean. We know that community dwelling older adults are, are accessing services um, much better than those isolated seniors are. And so uh, I think this is something that we do need to put our thinking hats on about and figure out ways in which we can better measure things um, over the phone or, or through the mail. And maybe moving forward with the next cohort of seniors, they'll be better with technology than the current cohort. But uh, time will tell. I mean, we're struggling with technology today. So yeah, in the future, right? Um, so with that, uh, it's almost 10 after 3. Uh, I want to thank our speakers again. I really appreciate you coming on and, and giving these talks. They were fantastic. And I think uh, based on the number of questions and the discussion that's been happening, it, it goes to show that this is definitely something of interest, uh, not just in our special interest group, but probably beyond as well. So I encourage you all to uh, take a look at the special interest group on aging in Isbinpa. Um, and uh, consider coming to the meeting when we have one again. Uh, these are the types of folks that attend and the types of talks that we have. Um, and uh, encourage you to reach out to us as well if you have ideas for our newsletter or for the next webinar, we'd be uh, happy to consider them. Uh, thank you again, everyone. And uh, a recording of this webinar will be available online soon. Anything to add there, Antonio? Yeah. Thank Good. you. Okay. Thank That's you, everyone. Okay. Bye. Bye-bye. Bye, everyone. Thank you.